You know, everything we do has a function and it makes us feel safe and well-balanced and comfortable. But that doesn't create difference and it doesn't create, it's not challenging. <laughs> The only real place in society where you can do things that is, uh, defies expectation, breaks boundaries, contradicts status quo, is progressive, experimental, might not work, is in art. So it's essential that there's a place in society like art where all the mad stuff can happen. It's funny, when I was a kid, I used to make art in the garage, my mum and dad's house. They had a garage you could put the car in, but it was just full of shit. And me and my friend Max, we used to have it as a studio. We were only 16, 17, but we really wanted to be artists. So we had this garage and we put all our stuff in it and we used to smoke rolled up cigarettes and drink herbal tea and make terrible art but we felt like artists. And I remember the feeling of being there made me feel a little bit uncomfortable and mad. I was like, what am I doing? Why am I embroidering graffiti onto uh, a bus seat? Or why am I like smashing milk bottles and painting them on the inside and gluing them back together? You know, all these things that made no sense. When you think about the reasons for doing things, we question, you know, or you question an object that you've never seen before. We ask things like use, cost, function, worth, authorship, ownership. And I think when you're a young artist, there's no point to it. It doesn't create money. It doesn't, the only thing it does is enrich your life personally. But then as you get older, if you sell art or you have an exhibition and people see it, then there's a function to it. So it loses its madness. You know, as soon as you, you exchange art for money, it's lost its madness because there's a reason to do it then. But I really loved making art when there was no logical reason to do it. It was an absurd lifestyle. And so I think in this era of safety, we have to remember to embrace absurdity and danger and risk. In a way, if there's one subject that my work's about as a whole, it's about that. It's about the way that we distract ourselves from this kind of existential fear, this, this kind of like the human, the realization, the human condition. Uh, I found the studio because my wife found it on the internet and it was a sports centre, like a leisure centre complex. So people got married here and people played badminton and people actually still come with yoga mats on a Wednesday and say, we're here for the yoga. And I'm like, it's not a yoga studio. I mean, for me, this studio is a bit like heaven because it's like going to art school again. So to have an uh, art school that's just yours, where you can do anything you want, whenever you want, is kind of mad. And then this is my office in here. And the way that I get these onto the wall is this system over here. So I have in each of these boxes, box files, there's a wad of photographs and the photographs have post-it notes on. Uh, and each one of them is a starting point for an artwork. And I know what it is, but you probably, if you looked at them, you'd think it was something completely different. But each one is a work in itself. 
So these end up there, and those end up there, those end up there. When people come in this room, in my office, they think it's like, um, you know, in Silence of the Lambs, the murderer in the basement makes the, the map of how he's going to kill everyone. It's a little bit spooky. Because it looks, uh, but, you know, and the other thing is people always say, oh, you've got so many ideas, you have so many ideas. I don't have any more ideas than anybody else in the world. It's just that I write them all down and stick them on the wall. Everyone has this amount of ideas, if not more. It's just you forget them. People have ideas at the front of their mind and some of them they put in the back of their mind, some of them they forget. The ones they put in the back of their mind usually just disappear because they don't recall them. And I was noticing that I was having a lot of things where I thought, oh, I, I should make this. And then I'd forget it. And then I'd go to a gallery and I'd see it. And I'd be like, fuck, I wish I'd made that. Someone's made it before me. You know, in, in semiotics, you have sign systems, you have like conventional signs and natural signs. And conventional signs is language, traffic lights, painting, all the things that humans make to tell other humans things. But then there's natural signs and they're things that tell humans things, but they're accidental. So like footprints in the snow is a natural sign. They tell you that somebody walked that way and that only one person walked that way but it wasn't made purposefully to communicate that to you. So, yeah, my real love for language and for semiotics is to make artworks that are natural signs inside the institution of art that people mistake or get confused about whether they're the real world, fictional or reality inside the institution, outside the institution. My dad was an engineer, worked in a car factory in south of Liverpool. Uh, and my mom worked in a school and then later she was like a teacher in a special school. So it was kind of like a non-art house. Not that they were against art, just that there was other things to deal with. That's what, you know, art is for the privileged because you need, it's not about privilege and money, it's about privilege of time. To enjoy art, you need spare time. And spare time is the greatest privilege because to have spare time, you also need spare money. I was brought up in hospital between like being born and puberty. I was probably in hospital half the time, maybe. Maybe a bit less, but oh, yeah, half the time. Um, and I think the biggest thing about that is you're in a bed in a fixed position and you don't move around. Uh, and you're being socialised by adults, nurses and doctors, because the kids just come and go very quick, so you never have a relationship with any of them. Uh, and, you know, I was there for like six weeks and then three months, and then two months. and then. So if you're in bed all the time, you use your imagination to travel rather than... and to envisage things and see things. Because, you know, the, the imagination has incredible capacity. It can be used as a tool to, like, make prototype realities, if it's strong enough. Kids have it, you know, when we're born, the imagination is incredibly strong, but over time it deteriorates. Um, and I was just like, yeah, I wanted to be at the kids' party, I wanted to be at school, I wanted to be it sports day, I wanted to go to Disneyland, I wanted to go to the outdoor swimming pool, I wanted to go to the beach. Was, I couldn't go to any of these things. So I used my imagination. And I think in doing that, the imagination became a little bit overactive. Like, it's like that if you go to a museum, it's like taking your imagination to the gym. It's like you use any muscle. If you use it a lot, then it gets really strong. And I guess that's what happened because I, I still have quite a strong imagination. It didn't deteriorate with age as quickly as other people's, it seems. And I find a lot of grown-ups quite boring. <laughs> and I have a lot of fun with my kids because we can, I'm good at pretending. 
You know, when I get under a table, it's got a sheet over it. It really is a house in my mind. So there's that. And then the other thing was, if you're, you can't move around, you can't do things for yourself. As a kid, you become very reliant on communication and being good at convincing people to do things for you. And that turned out to be a kind of organisational skill in maybe being able to get people to come together to do something that's really good fun, but with a great objective at the end, which is a bit like the studio, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, those two things are nothing to do with art. They're two skills or character accidental characteristics of happenstance of my life that have led me to be an artist. You know, because people think, oh, to be an artist, you have to be really skillful at this, or you have to train hard, you have to practice the repetition of doing the same thing again and again. That's how I'd be an artist. That's bullshit. That's not art. It's nothing to do with art. Art, by its very definition, is about defying expectation and making people see difference. And those two characteristics, which I guess are from me being socialised in hospital, led me to this occupation. Hi. We're filming, so if anybody's on a witness protection programme, you need to hide your identity. tells itself stories to understand who he is. Other animals, we call this fable. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. So this artwork is called The Prophet, a 2000 year collaboration. And I think it's from 2019, maybe. Um, and it's an animatronic mouse. It's all artificial. It's not a stuffed mouse. It's, it's a sculpture that moves. And the voice is Olive, my eldest daughter, when she was much younger. And we recorded it in here in the recording studio. Every artist has a work that people remember that's significant. And I guess this is one of mine, that or the wind piece that was at Documenta or a few other things. But. It's become really popular, the mouse. There's, um, so it's a trilogy, there's three speeches um, and three different coloured mice and they make up one, like, uber work, the three together. The world is a wonderful place. Humans are wonderful. But we have lost ourselves and our own self I like, I like the idea that usually artworks shout for attention and they're bright and they're big and they're colourful and they're shiny. Um, but you know, if you're quiet, people listen more, which is something that we've forgotten. When people shout. Um, it reminds us that someone is demanding our attention, like the language of advertising. Uh, and if you whisper and you don't create, don't demand attention, you actually get more attention, weirdly. There's also a weird kind of scale thing that if an artwork is much smaller than you and you have to get down, I mean, the voice is quite quiet on purpose, so people have to crouch down on the floor and get to the level of the artwork. So they're almost tricked or manipulated into interacting with it without even realising that they're doing it. Strangely, you would think that adults and children interact differently with this work because the imaginations of adults and children are different, but they don't. And for me, that is a sign that it bridges that gap of the imagination. It, she is so captivating, really, that it turns adults into children, which is, for me, that's like a, um, an objective and a success of it, yeah. Yeah, I love her. 
she's my favourite of all the things I've made, I think. Um, and I could just watch her and listen to her all day. Um, this is my office at home, and it's in a it's in a medieval market town called Saxmundham, which sounds very Harry Potter. But I've lived here. We've lived that we've had this house I think fifteen years, so we've always lived here since the kids were born. I work here a lot in a different way to the way that I work at the studio. I only have really good ideas or clear thinking when I'm not distracted, obviously. So that idea of having an epiphany or everything coming together in your head, having all these, all these things floating around in your head and everything just coming together um, and becoming clear, that only happens to me when I, in situations where I don't have my mobile phone. So if I'm washing off because my hands are wet, if I'm driving the car, it happens. And I recognised that all the times that I was having really clear, great thinking going on in my head were these moments without my phone. Um, so I work here very often without the internet on. I turn the internet off and I just work in here. Um, and I do have a computer here, but I often also force myself in the morning not to open a computer or a phone um, and just rely on paper because I just think there's a different, you end up with a different effect on your brain. I never have creative blocks. I never have creative blocks because I have all, I've, I've written down all my ideas so I could just pick one. I have the, uh, the, that other problem, which is a greater one, of procrastination. Two other problems, actually. One is procrastination, that you talk yourself out of making a work because you don't, you don't sustain enough confidence in yourself. And then the other problem is there's literally too many ideas. When you've written down all your ideas, as you, you know that you're going to die and most of them won't be made. And that's like a terrible fear. Because then the, then the problem is not having a mental, uh, artistic block. It's not, not having ideas. It's not knowing which one is more important than the other one. They have to be made in an order because some of them won't be made. So which one is the most urgent idea? Which one is the one that you want to leave in the world for other people? Because I'm really interested in, you know, time and action and distraction and the attention economy. I think like um, maybe distraction is a is a real killer of creativity. The effect that the technology and being connected has on children or has on us all, I would have thought, is that we we lose our agency. We're not I don't think I don't think we have control of our own agency anymore. We have this addiction problem where we become passive and ap we, get, we, we end up with apathy to our attention. So, you know, the most valuable, one of the most valuable things is our attention, what we spend our attention on. So I think we measure the world in things, in stuff, in numbers. Time is numbers, money is numbers, development is numbers, progress is numbers, you know, things, tangible, physical stuff, information, objects, cars, 
all this stuff. Artworks, paintings, sculptures. But we should understand the world in moments, in stories and untangible, intangible, ephemeral, non-physical things. Because it's kind of like Shinto or Buddhism in a way. It's like suburban Buddhism. You don't take any of this stuff with you. Your air fryer, your smoothie maker, your, you know, Citroen Picasso, they don't go with you, that's for sure. So it's a good way to talk about life, my life, my understanding of life, but it's also the central subject to the things that I make because I make work about the value of things and the value, the greatest values aren't money, they're not things, they're not physical. They're your attention and your time. And people, you know, we all know it. If I said to you, if you had three days left to live, would you spend it on Instagram? You'd say no. If you're a millionaire and I, you had a week left to live and I said, you give me all your money and you can live for two weeks. You'd give me all your money. So we know that these things are of the most value. We know walking the long way round to work, not the same path every day, is of value. And we know that not going on Instagram, but doing something deep rather than shallow with our time is of value. I make work to remind myself of these things. And because I do that, sometimes other people pick up on it and remember that um, time is your greatest asset. <laughs>